Welcome to the backstory on train noise and quiet zones in Longmont. My name is Tim Waters, and as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, uh, I enjoy the good fortune of interviewing uh, experts, activists, policymakers, government officials, uh, and community members on uh, topics of relevance and interest to Longmonters. And today, we are going to dig into or tell the story of uh, a big deal, uh, a, a significant project that's about to, to move forward in Longmont that will get the attention of almost everybody in town because of, of what it's gonna require. But this is an opportunity to tell the story about where it comes from, why we're into it, and, and what Longmonters can anticipate. So joining me in this conversation is Dr. Rick Jacoby. Welcome, Rick. Uh, people in, in, who will be viewing this ought to know that uh, you just took one hat off on as a practicing physician and have uh, <laughs> moved into a new chapter of life. I want to tell you it's a great chapter of life, uh, <laughs> chapter after full-time employment. Jim Angstad, Jim is our chief, is Longmont's. I do this with my volunteer hat on, so I'll say Longmont's chief engineer. Tyler Samey is our traffic engineer. So uh, if, if people haven't had a chance to work and meet with with Jim and Tyler, um, you should know these are um, A-team, City of Longmont uh, engineers uh, and good people, as well as uh, uh, very highly skilled. And if you do know them, uh, you can just affirm what I've said. So gentlemen, uh, let's get into it. Uh, let's start with the, where this conversation started. Personally, first conversation I was ever in about trains and train noise was with Rick Jacoby. Uh, so Rick, I'd like to start with where you started, at least with me, in, in, in telling the story about train noise and why we're in this conversation. Sure, thank you. Well, well, we talked, I think, in 2018, but the story goes way back before that. It's, it really started, uh, I've lived in town for over 20 years, but it started for me in 2005 when a federal mandate came out to make the train horn louder and longer. And uh, it was a big issue for the city at that point, too, apparently, because the city did a survey asking, was this a problem? And, and something like half the, the residents said it was a serious or very serious problem. And the city actually said, well, look, we, we're going to make quiet zones, uh, which is a way to rebuild the, the intersections so the train doesn't have to blow its horn. And uh, they, they said they would do it. They put it on the capital improvement plan but as an unfunded project and it's pretty expensive and it was convenient to forget and it got forgotten for about 10 years. Um, I got involved about 2015 when uh, the, uh, the renovation of the old turkey plant site came about and uh, the city was working with the developer for them to pay for half of the quiet zone compliant crossing at First and Emory. And um, I didn't know the full story at the time. I just saw that uh, I was being RTD'd again. Um, you know, I was, I've been paying taxes for about 10, 15 years. And all of a sudden my tax money was going to help somebody else with a quiet zone crossing down there. So uh, I marched down to city council and I gave them a, a, a piece of my mind <laughs> that the public invited to be heard and uh, said that, hey, you know, uh, we've been living with this and suffering with this for a long time. And um, I came away from that, I, I hit a nerve. I had a lot of neighbors and residents in the city come to me with, uh, you, you tell them and what can we do? We've got to change this, da 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 da, da. So we actually, uh, a group of us met in my dining room and we talked about how to, to get involved and put a fire under the feet of the, the city government to get this uh, done. And so since then we've, um, we've met with Transportation Advisory Board we marched in a, a big groups to city council and we, we talked to city council at several presentations. And um, we tried to make it an issue with uh, city council elections. We kept bringing it up with council members. And you may remember that Tim, when uh, you were first running that we tried to bring it up with everybody. And then after you were elected and others were elected, I brought the information back to council members. And I think that's when you contacted me. So it's been going for a long time. This has been, what's it now, 16 years? So well, that's kind of how we got to where we're at. Three observations. One is 
this is a, <clears throat> an affirmation of the value of perseverance, right? Persistence, number one. Number two, um, that uh, you turned uh, you turned RTD into a verb, right? <laughs> and number three, um, for, for residents who think individuals or neighborhood groups can't make a difference, sometimes it's not overnight, but, it's, but it is an affirmation that you can have an impact. And in this case, it's gonna be a big one. So thanks for getting us started. Who would like to tell some of the history here? I, I think it's useful uh, Rick made reference to what happened in 2005. Let's go back to when the train sh showed up in Long Line. Um, why was that important? And what, had the, what were the concessions that had to be made to get a train to come through Long Line? Jim or Tyler, do you have that part of that story or Rick, any of you? Well, you know, so when you want to talk history uh, yeah, in Longmont, um, going back to the, the 1870s, um, you know, there were no automobiles, horse, you had horse drawn carriages. Uh, a train, bringing a train to town was a big thing. It was a big thing for, for transportation of, of not just people, but also of goods and services. So, uh, you know, it was, it was the, the, the big thing in town that we could get a train in uh, that came in. Um, so the, the concessions um, what was at that time was basically uh, property. Um, that, uh, and, and you can see that in, in, in the ownership of the property today, uh, the city conceded and, and gave up, uh, and actually didn't actually give up property, but gave up easements along, at least from third up to ninth, uh, so that the railroad didn't have to come in and buy property. Uh, but, you know, looking back historically, uh, that, that was, a, that made, that put Longman on the map, that you had a, a train coming through and, in, in, and it has moved and, and still moves today a tremendous amount of goods. Okay, we, throughout our history, it was, we were a farming community uh, just starting out. And, and that's what, you know, to sell your, bring your stuff to market, to, to sell things, that's what, how you moved goods at that time. So the, the, the easements or the, the property rights were granted like in perpetuity, is that correct? It's like as best as on. we can find in the record, yes. Because yeah, yeah. you know, in, in looking back, they were all nowadays. You you do stuff electronically. Then everything was handwritten. Yeah, and uh, and for Longmont, if, if go to Loveland, to Fort Collins, the the train getting the train to come through town was like a lifeline, wasn't it? I mean, yes. it was it was the difference between surviving or not, potentially, uh, to have that kind of uh, commerce that was associated with the train. So. There's a long, rich, uh, and valued history of the train in Longmont. Um, so for, you know, a hundred years plus, uh, not big issues, but, but Rick made reference to what, what happened, what changed uh, that, that gave rise to some, the issues were now problems we're now trying to solve. Dig a little bit more into that. Uh, a decision was made, was it 2005, Rick? Well, I think the, the feds made the decision before that, but before that, it was up to the states to regulate train horns, I believe. Um, and the horns, when I, when I moved to the historic east side, were definitely present, but not a big nuisance. But uh, I think it was in Florida, they, they made a law that said the trains don't have to blow the horn at their discretion at night, because certainly it can be a big nuisance. And there was a big accident at night. And then the feds came in and said, look, we can't have this. We've got to make it safer. And they came with a standardized rule. But the train became much louder than the, the traditional train and much lo uh, longer horn. And that's when it became a big problem. Tyler, you want to add to that? Yeah, so if I could add to that. So, so Rick, you, Rick's definitely up to speed on, on a lot of the history of that. So beginning about the 1970s, a lot of the communities started, in, started enacting whistle bands. And, and that was really... Um, Rick mentioned Florida. I think Chicago was one of the pioneers as well in implementing a lot of the whistle bands where they said, operators train, sorry, you can't blow your horns, your whistle's coming through town. Um, as a result of that, FRA did see an increase in crash rates with trains. And I think that that was one of those big studies they did was to tie use of horn to crash rates at, at, at grade crossings. And there was a positive correlation made to um, 
the horn does provide a, a, a safety benefit at those crossings. And first and foremost, the whistle is a safety tool. And, and really it's to help prevent those crashes at the intersections. And so when you talk about creating a quiet zone, we're taking away the whistle, that big safety tool, which is, it's, it's very crude and rudimentary, but it's, it's a direct feedback tool. The operator whistles the horn, he knows he has positive confirmation the horn is working. It's about as easy as it can get for a safety tool. So, and the FRA in this case is? I'm sorry, what's that? The FRA, you made reference to the FRA. Yep, thank you. FRA, Federal Railroad Administration. So they regulate the railroad. So local control over railroads is, is not, not very much. FRA is the governing body over railroad decisions. Which I think is an important part of the story locally. Uh, as, as people have expressed their concerns, why doesn't the city council or why doesn't fill in the blank, the city manager or the chief engineer, somebody do something about that? Well, it has a lot to do with who's authorized to set those regulations. And in this case, the Federal Railroad Administration, because of what had happened across the country in terms of accident rates going on. Right. Yep. So um, in Longmont, we've read you read in the, uh, the TC line or correspondence that council members get or just generally uh, comments about how much people enjoy that the nostalgia associated with trains, train horns. Right. Uh, so we've read about I live in town and I've enjoyed that train horn for my entire life. You know, I'm a native of Longmont. Uh, why would anybody care about that? Um, uh, Rick, talk a little bit about your experience as a resident along the trail line, and not just yours. What's the experience of people who, who live in proximity, who when they bought their homes, there was one set of regulations, subsequent to the purchase of their homes, a new regulation, which changed your life a lot. Right, right. Uh, you know, I train noise in a distance is a nice, wistful, romantic sound but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And uh, I like a, a nice campfire too, but I don't put my hand in the fire, you know? Uh, living in Old Town, uh, we have beautiful old homes, but they're a double-edged sword. The architecture is not designed for air conditioning. I have actually, my house was built in 1885. It's, it's a lot of fun, but I have three gas heaters in the place trying to keep it warm here in, uh, in uh, January now. And to retrofit it for air conditioning would be very difficult. And, but I have 10 foot high ceilings. And what the old, the pioneers did was they had high ceilings, the heat would rise and the summertime was uh, very manageable because of the high ceilings. And what we do is we open the windows at night to let the hot air out and let the cool air in because uh, we have, we're blessed with such lovely uh, cool evenings here in the summer. And that worked fine until the train noise came along. And then uh, now, uh, I mean, I have neighbors telling me their, their kids are crying uh, every time the train goes by. And it certainly wakes people up at all hours of the night. We just never know when it's coming. Um, so it's been a big impact downtown. But I can tell you also, since I started coordinating this with some of the residents, I'm hearing about it from folks on the west side. I'm hearing about it from folks all around the city. And it's amazing uh, to me how you can have someone three blocks or two blocks from the train tell me, how come you're doing this and spending our taxpayers money? This is a waste of money two blocks away. And I have people you know, a mile away from the train saying, thank goodness you're working on this. This is a huge nuisance. Our tolerance of, of noise is very variable from resident to resident. Well, and noise, uh, not just train noise, noise is becoming a, a growing concern in terms of uh, the, the forms of pollution, right, that have serious effects, uh, real effects on people in a variety of ways. So uh, as a resident uh, and as a volunteer at Columbine Elementary School, when we could be at Columbine Elementary School as volunteers pre-pandemic uh, era, uh, to be with, to be in that school, I, it just, I was always amazed at how teachers and kids in Columbine could just kind of carry on as the train would roll by and, and blast that horn when, for me, it's, all you could do is stop. And the disruptions to the learning process um, uh, were very disconcerting to me as, as I would be involved as a, as a, as a volunteer at Columbine. 
So if, if I could say something, you know, it's interesting. I pointed out, I, we discovered in our research when we were trying to, uh, to lobby uh, city council to do something about this, there's a lot of data on train noise and this adverse impact on education. Uh, there has been studies where a classroom next to a train is almost a year behind in reading compared to a classroom across uh, the school. And the next year they, they moved the classrooms, they switched them and it negated the, the, uh, the, the disadvantage of that. And so it's, it's really interesting. There's been many other studies too and I could go into detail on that because we researched a lot of that and I was surprised at how much uh, the impact of consistent noise can affect especially developing kids. Yeah. So we're, we're headed toward a solution, but before we get into the specifics of it, we ought to acknowledge that the solutions that, that long monitors will begin to see implemented in uh, 2021 and beyond um, are not universally supported. There are some issues here, and I think it's important to acknowledge, number one, the process the city's gone through to get to a solution or an approach and the trade-offs that have to be made. Jim, you were, point person on a lot of this in terms of process and listening. I, I sat in sessions with you and Tyler and, and other uh, members of the city staff um, uh, trying to get a sense, get the priorities from the community, what they are, what they're not, and then come up with a plan that, that accomplishes something with, with, with respect to train noise, but also some other objectives that the city was trying to accomplish in terms of transportation. Talk us through what the process was and and what the trade-offs were in, in what we're accomplishing kind of big picture. So when we, we looked at, at quiet zones as a whole, you know, it, it's important to remember there are, are, I believe, 17 crossings in the city. And Tyler, you can jump in at any point if, if I got the numbers wrong. Um, and, and, and at various stages of, of kind of development um, and in, in the various areas of the city. Some of them are going through kind of commercial industrial areas where their impacts for quiet zones or the, the train noise is not that, that big. Um, as, as I came on board in the city a few years ago, um, th this, this project kind of gradually grew um, to the point where we, we were, were asked to present in front of council uh, and present a series of options for how to get and move the project forward. Um, and a project like this, uh, we, we've done a number of studies and, and Tyler had taken the lead um, on, on how to implement quiet zones. We had uh, a number of costs, uh, cost analysis, uh, the noise analysis uh, to move the, the project forward. So we had a, a lot of the, the, the work had been slow, but it had been moving forward. Um, the, the hardest thing is, is the implementation of it because of the cost. Uh, with 17 intersections. Mo most cities are implementing quiet zones, but they only have one or two crossings. We've got 17. Go ahead, Tom. And Jim, just to talk about the 17 crossings, just to be clear, we're talking about the BNSF main line that runs through town, uh, basically Ken Pratt, south of Ken Pratt on Hover, um, up along Ken Pratt, up Atwood, and up through 66. It does not include any of the spur lines, the spur line that goes to Lyons or the spur, spur line that heads out east towards me. Those are not included in this, just to be clear on what we're talking about, scope of the project. Yeah, we're, we're, we're focusing on the main line of BNSF through town from kind of the, the south, southwest and then as you go kind of north, um, go, going east and then north. Uh, but, you know, as, as we looked at it, you know, we, we did a, a series of public engagement meetings uh, and to offer up what 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 type of of improvement, safety improvement, do you want to do? The 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 easiest and simplest and you know, least expensive would be just close all the roads and have no crossings, and then the train can move through. One of the blood's horn is all. Certainly not a practical solution in, in light of of you know emergency services and mo and movement of of vehicles, pedestrians, and, and bikes through town. Uh, so we threw out and, and looked at a number of options when we had our public engagement meetings of what type of crossings we would want to improve. What safety improvements do we want to do? We included a couple of closures uh, where they were practical, um, as well as, as a series of double gates and street improvements that would help, as well as the system to tie it all in so that the trains can communicate with the crossings 
so that they would would uh, would not have to blow the horn. Um, one of the 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 as we were looking at our transportation system throughout the city, uh, one of the the other improvements that is is currently ongoing is is how to how to move buses in a in a more improved manner in conjunction with RTD and and Dr. Cog, which is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Uh, they are a, an organization that helps fund and looks to multimodal projects uh, and want to move buses around. So we we've looked at. Um, the city has been trying for a number of years to get a, another crossing at Boston Avenue uh, to help trans move goods, again, people, goods, services. Um, but the challenge with dealing with BNSF is they have a, a, a very, rather detailed manual um, that requires, in part, there's a requirement that for every one new crossing, you have to close two. So one of, of one of our plans is one of the other crossings. We were we were going to close it. It's a dead end street, um, has very little use. Um, so we were looking at and Tyler. The street was Terry Street. Terry Street um, between uh, kind of the uh, the uh, it's just two blocks uh, west of Maine, uh, and so we were looking for another crossing, and we were proposing. Um, fifth, sixth, one of the areas in the, in the downtown, um, and and finally came to to a recommendation to council, uh, which I believe we have to bring back in the future for that. But we were proposing to close fifth, which is certainly it, it is one of the least uh, expensive options. So there are other other considerations for what what crossings, um, and then there's also considerations as we implement the project is where where to start and how to move forward and get the biggest bang and the quickest bang. Because it's, it's also important to note that we will do the improvements, okay, do these safety improvements, but we still need to, to file with the PUC, Public Utility Commission, who is the governing body kind of of, of crossings and railroads in, in the state for a quiet zone. So we will be done with one or two of these intersections this year and we can then take that next step to file with the PUC. What's also important to note, because this, as I can say, this is very convoluted, very confusing, is that in the downtown area where you have crossings every 250 to 300, 500 feet, the train blows its horn a quarter mile before. So what you hear sometimes is you hear, it depends on the, 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 the engineer of the train, um, how he blows his horn. Sometimes he'll blow it with a couple of bursts as he approaches each intersection. A lot of times, and I've heard it at you know 4:30 on a Sunday morning, where he just holds on to that horn as he moves through town. Um, so we can we can institute some of these crossings and crossing projects in areas further north where it you may then have a, a, a greater benefit. Um, we're currently looking at handling the downtown in, an, in a kind of the downtown area from third to ninth in an order because that's where we, we see most of the impacts and most of the complaints. And that's actually the direction we got from council. Um, but it's also, as we look at how we budget these, it may be beneficial to jump ahead to one of the other intersections because that crossing will be less expensive to do. Uh, so we're, it is a, it, we're, we're trying to plan this as we move through. Currently we're we're working and finalizing design. Um, so that's kind of the current phase. Uh, we've been, we're almost completed with design on almost all of the intersections. And we've been working, um, and I don't want to jump ahead too far, Mr. Waters, um, in, in some of this. Uh, uh, so I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but that's kind of where we're at with the phase. We've got most of our design done. We're working towards it. Well, and so just to acknowledge, we're still not learning our way forward, but staging as we go forward. There's yes. decisions and you've got to take stock and do the, what the analysis of disruptions cost, et cetera. <clears throat> and, I, and I get that. I'm not trying to, I don't want, I don't want to, my intent is not to push you into uh, sharing what you can't share because decisions simply haven't been made. So I'll, I'll call the knowledge. We'll share anything. <laughs> oh, I know that. I know that. But when you haven't, when you haven't made a decision, you can't, you know, I, I don't want you to speculate. Um, uh, I'm one of I'm one of the residents in town 
Um, and sometimes with my city council, I just wondered, why don't we just take on BNSF? Let's go to the PUC and challenge them there. Um, and then as I've learned who, who has authority and what the implications are, it's not quite as simple as simply taking a hammer to BNSF. Either of you wanna reflect on uh, the, the stakes in terms of our relationship with BNS, their authority. I mean, they, they can operate with impunity coming through Longmont, you know, and sometimes only as a courtesy that they notify us that they're doing something. Is that not fair or accurate? I think that's very accurate. Their their uh, their 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 main goal is they're a business, yeah. so their goal is to to move freight um, as much as they can, uh, and they've got you know a hundred plus years of history of running trains, and in that time, I think the, as a, as a public or as a business, they've they've learned how to how to do things very well. Uh, they've got really good law lawyers and really good. <laughs> So they've got, you know, a lot of the rules that are written, you know, <laughs> by like through FRA, um, are to that the the the, the, the that company's advantage. Um, and you know, when when I think when the the train rule, the horn rule first came out, there are a number of communities who who tried to 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 fight and are still fighting and have not been successful. Um, you know, there are there are. Are, are states who sued BNSF trying to get improvements or not, maybe not BNSF, but other train companies and have lost in trying to, to have them do improvements or not have train. One of the other challenges, uh, we were focusing on train noise, but last year we had um, BNSF decided let's run longer trains. So they're running these trains through town, mile long trains that are running from third to ninth up to Mountain View. And then they, they stop and block half a dozen intersections. So, you know, there are, are challenges with that. And, yeah. and the city has, 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 while we try and we put file complaints, file complaints with FRA, we don't see a lot of, 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 uh, of action on either part to, to help us out. Yeah, without being too uh, critical of BNSF, it feels at times like municipalities are it's simply an inconvenience at this point to, to their operations, <laughs> and that doesn't, that doesn't feel very affirming. Uh, so uh, they have good lawyers, they have a lot of money, and they have precedents, right? The railroads. So, yes, so yes. then the so municipalities are left with what hands or cards do you have to play uh, to, to bring a solution to the residents. Part of the trade-off here, you mentioned the, the Boston Avenue crossing, Part of the trade-off, both for cost and for based on their regulations or policy, required closing a couple of streets, and that that's where there is some uh, disappointment or some uh, unhappiness on the part of some Longmont residents that we're going to see at least one intersection or one street, maybe more blocked, in order to accomplish uh, the objectives here, and that's regretful, but it's it is what it is. Uh, into, if we're going to move forward with the creating quiet zones, is that a fair statement? Yes, yeah. and we we've looked at the you know studied that the kind of the proposed crossings to to try to to identify which crossing would have the least impact from a pedestrian movement of pedestrians, movement of bikes, movement of vehicles, as well as as would it you know in that area of of fourth, fifth, sixth would would you know, would it impact the school that's that's along there? We, we, we would, that's one of the factors we also looked at yeah. to try to, to understand, you know, should we go ahead with a full-blown cross uh, closure? You know, how would that impact that, the, those, the movement of, of, of all types of traffic? Um, you know, and as well as the bigger, you know, biggest one also, one, another big one is emergency services is, you know, they're the, the kind of, I want to say the, the, the advantage in that area is the, the, it's the shorter block distance. Uh, you can get around there. Uh, it's a more of a, it's a, it's a bit of an inconvenience, but not as bad as if we were to close a street that has a half a mile distance to the next yeah, property. Yeah. And, and I, I could, I, I'd like to clarify, it's not, the, the closure of Fifth Avenue isn't necessary for quiet zones. We could put another quiet zone compliant crossing in there. The closure of Fifth Avenue is required for the continuation of Boston Avenue. 
and we're coordinating it with the Quiet Zone project. Yes. So the, 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 it's been very controversial in my neighborhood and we're more impacted than anybody by the trains because 8th Avenue was closed in order to put 21st Avenue crossing in. And yes, the, the FRA holds all the cards. You know, there's the regional government, there's the state government, there's the federal government, there's God, and then there's the trains, as they yeah. say. Um, but it, so it's very frustrating for my neighbors to see Fifth Avenue being closed, but it, it's not necessary for the quiet zones. It's necessary for the Boston Avenue extension. That is correct. Yeah. Yes. So, so talk a little bit about, <clears throat> uh, we've had, just as you're staging this project, uh, there's been staging in the budgeting process, right? Uh, decisions had to be made how we're going to pay for this as a city. Are you going to ask people to, are you going to finance it with you know, debt, fin debt financing? Are you going to do it uh, cash and carry? Uh, where, how, how, why are we now in 2021 budgeted to move forward with this project? What happened? The decisions that were made and, and successes in, in terms of uh, pursuit of other resources. Just talk a bit about why we're now positioned to pr proceed with the project. So we were, you know, um, year, year and a half ago, we were directed by council to, to, to begin forward with, with the quiet zone project. So we, we looked at, at how we could budget. Um, and, and what we're talking about is we're talking about, you know, with, with 17 crossings, uh, an $8 million plus project. Uh, and then the numbers came in all, you know, in, in, in different forms. Um, that doesn't include the design. Uh, so we, we looked at, at, at basically the, 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 there were a number of options. Uh, could we debt finance? At that point, we, we, we were not able to um, as the tax, the, the main funding for our streets group or streets uh, um, fund is out of our sales and use tax. And that was, uh, uh, was not a permanent tax at that point. Um, there was uh, um, an effort later that we, we did get it approved for that. Um, now we, we do have that as an option, but we've been able to spread the project out over a number of years. Okay, so we looked at, there's, there's a million dollars, I believe, and I can have to look away from the screen to check my budget. There is um, in the 2020 budget, which we, we planned in 2019, we put in um, $1 million. We carried over some dollars that were there already. So it was about $1.2 million there. Uh, in 2021, we have $2.1 million. And then in 2022, we budgeted 4 million and then 1 million in, the, in 2023. So um, back in the beginning of 2020, uh, there was an opportunity. And, and, and throughout this whole thing, we were looking for other, other means of, of funding uh, to help leverage the city dollars. We were going, knew we would have to program into a budget. Um, so we were able to, um, we applied for a, a, what's called a Chrissy grant uh, many years before and that we were unsuccessful with that. And so, but we continued that effort. And then um, I would like to thank Tyler. He was the one who took the lead on it. And um, so in February of last year, we got notice that um, our grant was, a, application was approved. So we were able to, as part of last year's budgeting and those numbers I just rattled off, able to, to budget over a course of time, the, the full component of the project because we received a, or are in the process of, of, of getting a $4 million grant from the FRA. Um, so, so basically we're matching. Well, we, we, we got, yeah, it is, it actually is a reimbursable grant. So we have to put out at basically $8 million to get reimbursed $4 million. Yes. But that can go through the course of four years. Yeah. So we'll start, be able to work some of those and then seek reimbursement. But we show eight, the $8 million in, in, in our expenditures in the budget. There's also a $4 million revenue shown in there now. Uh, the, and, and kind of we had, we had originally proposed to be started in December of last year and early this year in construction, the challenge and why the project's now delayed is, is we, we got notice that we got the grant, but we have to go through um, and do a grant agreement with FRA, which is what is taking a bit of time right now. So is, is uh, Tyler inside the organization known as the $4 million man now? <laughs> 
Tyler, talk a little bit you about your- You may be too young to actually was, remember the Million Dollar Man show. <laughs> uh, uh, Tyler, I think, I think you're gonna be a point person, right? On, uh, at least I know Jim defers to you uh, in terms of laying out schedule and what, what people can expect or anticipate. Talk about uh, once this gets moving, once you get the agreement set with, with FRA, um, what can local, what can Longmonters expect? There'll be, there'll be disruptions, I'm guessing, to some intersections because there's a lot of infrastructure work that has to be done. Talk about the schedule and what we should anticipate. Sure, so for 2021, we've got five crossings on the docket that we're looking to make improvements. One of them, Emory Street, is, as Rick mentioned earlier, is not included specifically in this project. It's being funded through partially private funding for the Emory, for, from that development adjacent. The other crossings we're looking at doing, 3rd Avenue, Long's Peak, 9th and 17th Avenues are the ones we're looking at trying to get done in 2021. In terms of what will residents see for the work, we've got some curb and gutter work to do. There will be potentially some storm sewer adjustments. Um, overall scale of the actual project is not a major, it's not a, like a major road reconstruction or a big rebuild. So the actual scope of the work is relatively minor. The big, the big work is railroad work. Them and the BNSF installing their infrastructure for their equipment is, is going to be a bulk of it. Um, there will be some, I anticipate some lane closures and potentially some road closures to facilitate some of the work. I don't think that'll be a long, particularly long duration. So um, what is it more than just putting arms that come down with lights that blink? There's, yeah, so what, what, what of, more than that? Sure, the, the big thing and one of the big cost items in this is the constant warning time circuitry that I think Jim mentioned earlier. And that's circuitry that goes in the track so that they've got enough warning in advance of the train getting to the crossing. So the gates always go down 20 seconds before the train gets there just for that consistency of no harm going. Um, that, that's just one of the big cost items. The gates and arms and flashers are um, not necessarily large cost items, but that helps provide that feedback for, hey, trains here, you need to stop. There's some other, when you mention curb work and are there, me, are there medians that will be installed in some of those intersections? Some, depending on the intersection, um, some, some of the treatments could be gates only. Some will be a combination of medians and gates. I think Ninth Avenue, we're looking at extending median um, from the track and then adding gates only on the approach side and where you can do that that can be a more cost effective solution than going with the all quad gates and the reason is to to limit options for for automobiles or other vehicles to to try to game that intersection right to find their right. to navigate their way around the arms absolutely the thought process is if you only have the approach gates without any medians that drivers could absolutely do that they could um, navigate through there um, and try to try to beat the train per se. The, the median generally what we're looking for is a hundred foot length of that median from the track to the end of the median. And that seems to be effective at preventing people from making that decision. So Tyler, you think you said, do you say four intersections in 2021? And then it'll, it, it, this will extend through into 2023. Yep. Right, to, to, finish, finish. to finish the so 20, 2024 is what we're showing is our are out here. So we've got three crossings in 2022, four more in 2023, and then four more to finish it off in 2024. And when it's all finished, should long monitors anticipate that they never again hear a train noise? Train, <laughs> train <laughs> horn? So, so train, trains are noisy even without the horn. So I will say that the train will absolutely still make noise. Um, for the most part, the only time that we would be hearing a horn would be if there's an imminent threat. So a, a train operator will still sound the whistle if there's, say, a trespasser on the tracks or they see some safety scenario where they need to blow the whistle. All right. Well, fellas, I appreciate your, your willingness to spend time telling this story. What have we not shared that we should? Any last comments that, that um, any of you would like to share or that you think residents should hear before we wrap this up? I think on, from my perspective, I think that 
we're, we will work and continue to work on schedule as we've laid out as best we can. We talked a lot about the, the railroad and their regulation at the federal level. I think that ultimately there is some scheduling that we do not control that, that falls in the hands of BNSF. So we will do our best to follow the schedule that we've laid out. There could potentially be some variability that we don't control with BNSF scheduling. Anybody else? Well, and, as we, and then as we move forward and we get closer and closer, there will be more public engagement uh, and let people know what the, the status of the project is, uh, where we're gonna be working, uh, certainly notices to the, the surrounding residents of any disruptions. Uh, you'll see, you know, as we get closer and closer uh, and we're, it's, it's imminent, there'll be more than likely some type of, of variable message boards posted on some of the major roadways like Third Avenue where we're working to, to notify uh, the vehicular traffic. Uh, but uh, we will uh, certainly have a, a more aggressive public engagement uh, as we get closer and have definitive start dates and, and time frames. Very well. Any last words, Rick? Uh, I actually have a, a question, I guess, for either Jim or Tyler. Uh, as we're doing this in stages, are we going to sequentially get quiet zones in town or do we have to wait until the whole thing is built out to quiet the trains? Um, because uh, this couldn't have happened, this should have happened to me <laughs> 15 years ago. It can't happen fast enough. I think it's great that the city has been responsive. I'm, I'm still amazed that after sitting in my dining room with a bunch of folks that I could go and harangue the right folks, but in a city of 100,000 people, we can make things change. And I'm heartened by how the government has worked. But I'm curious about, will, this, will the quiet zones be uh, coming in starting next year and expanding over time, or will we have to wait the full three years? So Rick, I do anticipate that as we create zones that can be classified as quiet zones that we would be applying for those quiet zones. I think Jim mentioned earlier that kind of in the old town, there's several crossings that need to be improved before it can be implemented. So that can't be applied for until all of those crossings are complete. There are some per se 17th, 21st that are isolated crossings that could potentially be created as standalone. They could qualify to be quiet zones themselves and don't depend on any other adjacent intersections being improved. But also, as we mentioned, that direction from council was to work in the old town first. So if you'll notice in the first two years, it's really focused on working on those old town crossings. Great. We ready to put a wrap on this? Certainly. Rick, I wanna thank you for your uh, leadership on this, your activism in the community and all that you do what you did with your professional life and, and what you do as an active member of this community. Jim and Tyler, uh, you are two of the unsung heroes <laughs> in town and in the city of Longmont. So thank you for what you guys do every day. Um, uh, there's, it's, I, I know Tyler gets a lot of input on uh, everything from speed to street repair to you know traffic flow and handles it uh, with grace and with um, integrity every time. So thanks to you, Longmonters. Uh, that is your backstory on train noise and quiet zones in Longmont. Thanks for, thanks for listening.